Mr. Ranchow. Your Honor, may it please the court, counsel. Your Honor, the defendant, Mr. Jonas in this case, is a gay man. And the defense knew that during trial that there would be testimony that Mr. Jonas was in fact gay, that he did have an interest in pursuing a relationship with Mr. Paulson, and that he did make some kind of advance toward Mr. Paulson approximately a week before Mr. Paulson's death. Uh, prior to trial, the jury questionnaires were sent out, and one of the questions on the jury questionnaires was whether or not the fact that the defendant was gay would affect or have any effect on the potential jurors ability to be fair uh, to, the, to the defendant at trial. Now the jury in question, or the juror in question that um, this case is basically about answered that he could not be fair to the defendant because of his sexuality. Uh, what wasn't his answer to the question was the defendant in this case is gay would that fact in any way influence your ability to be fair or impartial if you're selected to be a juror in this case um, and his answer was I would try to keep an open mind but I would have a hard time overlooking it yes he did state several times that we try to be fair but then again in the back of his mind he kept stating in the back of his mind that the defendant's sexuality would be an issue for him Last question, um, um, knowing what you now know about the case uh, and yourself, do you think you would be a, a good juror in this case? He answers, yes. And then please explain, quote, I would try to keep an open mind, close quote. Do we, do we would, was the district court required to, um, well, couldn't all that be explored on board dire, of course? Yes. And we're reviewing for abuse of discretion. Yes. Correct. Yep. Um, and when the trial judge asked him if he could follow the instructions, didn't this juror say that answer yes without equivocation? Yes, he did. Was it an abuse of discretion then to keep to, to deny the motion to strike for cause? Well, I don't think it. Something that we can look at, just one answer that this juror gave. He gave a number of answers saying that, yes, he could be fair, but in the back of his mind that the defense sexuality would be an issue for him. Uh, he stated a few times that he was probably not the best person to be on this juror because of his... Well, in fact, he started out by saying that he had a problem. Uh, if, I, if I understand the colloquy collect correctly, and, and then the judge kind of got in and started asking whether he could follow the court's instructions mm -hmm. and he said yes and so the court is is engaging in rehabilitation effort uh, and then after the court was done there was further inquiry by Jonah's trial counsel about <coughs> the business of bias being in the back of his mind and he said something to the effect that yes I think it would be there yes sir so he started out with an expression of bias ended with the expression of bias and in between the court was attempting to rehabilitate him. Is, is my summary reasonably accurate? Or, and if it isn't, I, I need to be No, I, I believe it's accurate, yes. Okay. Um, <coughs> but why, why do you think you're entitled to relief if you had an um, uh, unbiased jury panel? You did strike this juror, if I understand it correctly. You used, used a peremptory challenge. Yes. Um, so why, what, why didn't you get a fair trial? Well, based on the record, it's hard to say whether or not the defendant actually did get a, you could say that he got a fair trial based on the jury that heard his case, but whether or not the process was fair and jury selection was fair to the defendant since he had, he was basically forced to use a preemptive strike to remove this juror who should have been removed for cause. Did you ask for an additional preemptive strike at any time? I don't think so, no. All right, you exhausted your peremptory strikes, if I remember correctly. Yes. But you never asked for one additional strike. No. All right, so how do we know that you weren't happy as clam with the jury? Well, again, based on the record, I don't think we can say whether or not we are happy with the jury that was seated and heard this trial. Um, 
again, the, the issue is really, really, really about the fairness of the trial and the jury. It's about the selection process of the jury that was unfair. The, uh, since the defendant had to use one of his preemptive strikes to remove this jury, he is effectively um, had nine preemptive strikes while the state had ten. That created an imbalance uh, between the state and the defendant. That, isn't that sometimes inherent in the process? Let's say there's two co-defendants and you represent one of them and the co-defendant strikes someone that you would have wanted. Mm -hmm. Isn't that sort of the same kind of unfairness? Well, in a way, but I don't think that uh, having the co-defendant strike someone that you may have wanted on the, on the jury isn't quite the same as the state still gets, you know, 20. Let's say it's a double murder trial. Each counsel got 10 if, it's, if the judge does it that way. Right. What about another hypothetical? Let's say the state uh, moved to strike someone for cause. The judge excused the juror for cause, but uh, on appeal you want to argue, well, that, that juror shouldn't have been excused for cause. The state should have had to burn a strike. Do you get an automatic reversal in a new trial for that? No, I would not think so. Um, again, that the, um, I mean, it's, it's the defendant's rights to a fair trial. The state is, of course, interested in having a fair trial as well, but it's the defendant has the most at risk. And as long as we're talking, the, I, I agree, there is a fundamental right to a fair trial. The question is, is this 9 versus 10, even assuming that this juror should have been stricken, sufficient that, that to render the trial so unfair that we need to have a, a, a do-over where there was a trial and, and, the, and your client was convicted? Well, again, that reaches the question of how many of these challenges that might be denied. Is one not enough? Is five too many? Is 10 too many? So uh, in order to be fair to all defendants, I think one should be enough, yes. Are you trying to argue this is a structural error of some kind? Yes. That the process wasn't fair? Well, where is the right to a peremptory challenge preserved in our Constitution? It is not explicitly preserved in the Constitution, either the state or the federal Constitution. However, it could be argued that there is an implication that the due process of law uh, allows that if there are preemptory challenges, or if the defendant in the state has a right to preemptory challenges, that they should be um, administered fairly. Um, you know, the history of preemptory challenges go back to, um, centuries. Uh, they were present in, in uh, England before the formation of this country, and we adopted it from uh, the English courts. So it's... Uh, oh, but could we constitutionally do away with preemptory challenges, I wonder? Excuse me? Could, I'm sorry. Uh, could we constitutionally do away with preemptory challenges? Are the, and the rationale would be that they're often used to exclude uh, racial minorities from jurors, from juries, and that we'd, just, we'd be just as well off not having mandatory um, preemptory strikes. Now, aside what you think of that policy, if we moved in that direction, would that be a constitutional violation? Uh, perhaps uh, if, I mean, it could be a violation of the due process clause, um, the right to a fair trial, that, um, again, like I said, it's not specifically stated in the Constitution that either party has a right to preempt your challenge or um, strikes. So, I mean, that would have to be litigated, of course, if that ever came up. Because well, you were one short um, of preemptory challenge, you, you had nine instead of ten. What, can you point to a juror that you had to leave on that was problematic, something about his or her background? No, there's nothing in the record indicating that. I was reading the other day about this case from Florida where they actually have a process in that state where if the defense makes a motion to remove a juror for cause and it's denied, the defendant then still has an opportunity to put on the record, which, uh, and the, they use preemptory to remove that jury, juror. Uh, they have a process where the defendant goes on the record and states which juror they would have struck if they could have had that extra preemptory challenge. Is that a Florida court rule or statute or? That was in a case from okay. a few years ago. 
I was reading the other day. Yeah, Fl Florida says this, and I don't know if you argued this. While not expressly provided for in Florida's Constitution, peremptory challenges are a necessary tool for achieving the constitutional right of a trial by an impartial jury. We are willing to demand that defendants use the tool to correct erroneous rulings on cause challenge, but do so without replacement of peremptory challenge utilized would, under the jurisprudence of this state, abridge the rights of the accused. I think that's the argument you're making, and I think Justice Apple talked about, did you ask for another uh, peremptory challenge, or should the court have given you one? But I, I didn't see any of this in the record here, or any of these arguments. No, they weren't in the record at trial, no. That's, again, why we're raising it on appeal, that um, the defendant should have been, uh, well, first of all, the jurors should have been challenged, for, uh, stricken for cause, and the uh, defendant should have had, had the full 10 preemptory challenges that he was entitled to. Uh, we are asking the court to reverse or at least modify the ruling in Neuendorf. Uh, Neuendorf states that if the, in, this, in instances like this, that the defendant has to show some kind of prejudice and based on the record in this case, there, there was no uh, request for an additional preemptory or uh, the defendant did not state which jury he would have struck if he had the extra preemptory so that the, um, we cannot, it's difficult if not impossible to show that the defendant was prejudiced by the jury that did hear his case. We are asking that the um, former rule before the, new, the Neuendorf case be um, used and that the, um, <coughs> that the uh, court finds that this was structural error and that uh, the uh, conviction should be reversed and should be remanded for a new trial. Um, in summary, the uh, defense asked that the court uh, respectfully request that the court uh, grant the relief requested. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Ms. Hines. May it please the court, counsel. The defendant asked this court to overrule Neuendorf and grant him a new trial because the district court allegedly abused his discretion in denying a challenge for cause and he was required to use a peremptory strike in selecting his jury. However, Neuendorf recognized, as to the majority of jurisdictions, that peremptory strikes are a means to achieve a constitutionally required end, which is an impartial tr jury trial. Mr. Jonas does not contend that he did not receive an impartial jury. He is, his objection is strictly with the process, that uh, procedural uh, aspect of his case in which he was denied, he allegedly denied. Uh, I'd like to push back on the abuse of discretion in, when I have a moment, but allegedly denied a uh, peremptory strike. The majority of courts have found that the erroneous denial of a strike for cause and the subsequent removal of that juror through a peremptory strike is not automatically prejudiced. Um, what, what, when the juror, particularly when the jury does uh, challenge, does not sit on the jury, there's no reason to think that the jury, he was not impartial. Uh, some cases have also examined whether the um, defendant has asked for additional peremptories, or whether they can point to people who are in the jury that they object to, but they have run out of peremptories. As we uh, discussed in um, the previous argument, they did not do that here, and they are unable to point to anybody that served on the jury that appears to have been impartial in any way. Um, so the, there's no need to requi require a new trial when Mr. Jonas got what he was uh, guaranteed, an impartial trial. I'm Let me ask about the rehabilitation here. Uh, um, you know, there's a lot of literature, as I'm sure you're aware, on judge-based rehabilitation. Some of it's not very um, uh, 
positive about Judge B's rehabilitation. And the critique that you see is that, well, judges ask leading questions. Uh, can, can you follow my instructions? And a poor layperson isn't going to say to an authority figure like the judge, no, I, can't, I won't do what you tell me to do, even though it's part of your role. And, and they kind of get, according to the literature, they, when, when a judge engages in aggressive uh, voir dire, um, uh, the veneermen tend to uh, conform to the judge's expectations, and then they curl up later. And that's exactly what happened here, as, as I read the record. I mean, he, he started out admitting a bias. Um, the judge then kind of cross-examined him and got him to say, well, I'll follow your instructions. Yes, Your Honor. And then when defense counsel got back to it, he said, well, it'll always be in the back of my mind. Um, that doesn't strike me as the kind of voir dire process we're looking for. Um, so actually, attack my factual scenario. I will. Um, actually, I, I read the transcript and see that the defense counsel started asking, asking very leading questions about his bias towards gay people. I think and it was not until those kinds of questions arose that he said he had something in the back of his mind. Um, this juror also, I would point out, said that he might have trouble serving a uh, on the jury because he had some work that he uh, was concerned about. And um, that, that leads into my um, position that the abuse of discretion here uh, should be looked at, the district court should be given a wide uh, length of abuse here because we don't know what the district court was seeing when these questions were going back and forth. As I said, I mean, there was some indication he had a concern about work. Maybe he thought, well, if I go along with the defense counsel, maybe this will get me out of jury duty. Um, the other thing I would point out is later in the trial, um, when they were not, no, the court was not doing rehabilitation, but it was the um, voir dire uh, for the whole panel, um, Mr. Stanger was asked um, whether he thought it was fair to require uh, proof beyond a reasonable doubt in a criminal trial. And he said, oh yes, yes, a man's life is at stake. Um, so I don't think that the judge's rehabilitation in this case did anything more probably than to even up the scale after defense counsel's questions. Kind of looked like the judge was an advocate. He asked the question, can't you, you know, after he admits bias, the judge starts cross-examining him and says, well, but can't you follow the instructions in my case? If I give you the instructions, will you well, follow? I think there was some frustration with the juror because he kept saying there's something in the back of my mind. Yeah, there was frustration. I, 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 that came yeah. out of the record and to me. There's something in the back of mind, but he never came forward and said that, that whatever was in the back of his mind would make a difference in his ability to be impartial. I don't read it that way. And, and isn't uh, one of the things that I think this juror 19 said a couple times is the defendant would be better off without me yes. on the jury. That's strikes me just reading that as, that's not really the applicable legal standard, that's what peremptories are for. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you very much for telling me, I'll use one of my peremptories on you. Exactly, and I think it's also made an indication that this juror was maybe not um, wanting to serve in this Except case. it's all the context of him saying he doesn't it like It is the age. context, and I want to talk, talk about something else on this cold record and reviewing abuse of discretion. The district court was there to see the demeanor of this juror and to see uh, his interactions with the defendant and to, uh, and with that, he had an impression that we just can't get on a cold record. And we should defer to that um, be because he had the superior uh, point of view. I, I use an example, or an example I was thinking of that um, it might be extreme, but you know, suppose this juror was, uh, wearing a t-shirt that said gay pride. You know, we don't know that up here, but it might have made a difference to the district court if he saw that. Now, I'm not saying that that's what all, at all would happen. I'm just using it as an extreme example of why on appeal is very difficult for a judge, for, for the reviewing court to find an abuse of discretion. Um, now, if, uh, I also would like to point out some things that um, would be, I think, very adverse consequences if uh, so New Neuendorf was, um, was over overruled. And one of those is that um, it incentivizes defense counsel to make more challenges for cause, uh, twist with the hope that maybe the district court would get one wrong, and then on appeal, you have a reversal. Um, it also, encourages the state 
to, to um, accede to most of the defense cha counsel's challenges for fear of uh, reversal on appeal. What would be wrong, though, to have a rule like other states that um, if the challenge for cause was denied, that you can ask for another peremptory challenge and the court should grant it to you as a safeguard? I, I think if the rule was written that way, I think that would there'd nothing, be nothing wrong with that. And I, and I do think some of those states are probably- Some courts have fortune that fashion that remedy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's probably a good way to avoid, again, what we're talking about a big thing to reverse a criminal trial of several days when there is no error other than that uh, the defendant might not have been able to it's use. It's a big thing for someone to go to jail. Of course. If the, the jury may or may not be biased against them. But the juror didn't sit on the jury. So, and we know from the, we can look at this by looking at voir dire to see that nobody else sat on the jury that had should have been set for cause. Um, I, I want to point that out because in Moots, in which there was a uh, reversal because a juror uh, or the defendant was improperly denied a preemptory strike, the juror sat and um, this court found that that was uh, required reversal. But part of the reason it did so is because it said it really couldn't tell how uh, how, that, how that jury impacted the jur jury as a whole. We couldn't look at anything to, s to see how that panned out for, for the uh, defendant. Here we can look at something. The, r the record allows us to look and see that none of the jurors that sat on Mr. Jonas's jury were anything but impartial. So he got exactly his constitutional due. Well, so you, I, I take it would be your view that we could eliminate peremptory challenges without a constitutional problem. I think without a constitutional problem, I, I, I have nothing against peremptory challenges. Um, I, I think that they serve a, a purpose of helping somebody um, form an impartial trial. I mean, isn't that what the U.S. Supreme Court said unanimously in Martinez Salazar? I'm quoting from Justice Ginsburg. Peremptory challenges are not of constitutional dimension. Yes, absolutely, they're not. They have a state auxiliary, right. auxiliary they, they, they have a, a state right based on our rule for 10 mandatory or 10 I'm sorry preemptory challenges oh. what we're dealing with is really a state created right that may not have constitutional dimensions they do, I don't think it has constitutional dimensions I do think there is a you know in my, my personal view I think it does some serves some good because um, I think Scalia noticed not, noted in the um, Martinez Salazar opinion that the peremptory strikes used to be used when um, the district court made an error and, and were intended to be used that way because there was no right to appeal. So that was the, in the defendant's um, arsenal to keep a juror off that the district court made a mistake and not keeping off himself. And, and excuse me, in Busby, the Florida Supreme Court said it has constitutional dimensions, at least under the Florida Constitution. So there are states that have, have gone that way. And we haven't never said in Iowa whether it's constitutional or not under the Iowa Constitution. No, we have not. And I don't think that Mr. Jonas has argued that, um, that it should be unconstitutional under the, or that it should be of constitutional dimension. This is a rule-based right, and uh, we have all sorts of constitutional errors at trial in which we do not have an automatic reversal for the conclusion on appeal that a mistake occurred. I don't sit, think that it makes sense to have an automatic reversal when we're looking at a non-constitutional error at trial. And that's uh, one, one of the justifications for other states in which they have found that you must show that a, the jury that sat was not impartial is, or that the jury that was um, not denied for cause sat on the, on the jury. And we do not have any of that here. In fact, and I, I, I know our rules allow judges to ask for dire questions, but the, the, the question I have, if the judge asked the question to appear to be favoring one side or the other side, would that be reversible error? No, I, I think as long as they have, they have a impartial jury that is ultimately selected, I don't think that would be constitutional error. 
I, will, I want to point out, too, another case, or another juror here that I thought was interesting. Um, it's M Mr. Fry, who was uh, struck for cause, and the state joined in that um, challenge because he was, he was questioned about his opinions upon of, uh, Mr. Jonas's being gay, and he basically said, no, you know, I, I, I can't say that I'm going to be fair to him at all. I can't fa say that I, I would be able to do that. And he was very, very strong in that opinion. And of course, he was struck and struck for cause. Um, it, just in contrast with uh, the juror that was not struck for ca uh, cause, I think it shows you that nobody was um, trying to necessarily to re rehabilitate uh, Mr. Stanger, it was just a matter of degree. And Mr. Stanger was not expressing the degree of inability to be fair that, that the juror that was ultimately struck did. These are, sh these are shades of gray, and the district court is making these decisions on a fast-paced, minute-to-minute basis. And a mistake can be made, but does that mistake require reversal if the defendant ultimately gets a fair and impartial juror? And the state's position is no, and that Neuendorf is the correct uh, rule in Iowa, and it should be followed. The state respectfully respects, I mean, respectfully, requests this court to affirm Mr. Jonas's conviction. Ms. Hines, thank you. Rebuttal? May it please the court. Your honors, um, this juror, like probably most people, have a hard time admitting their biases in, the, in public, much less in the court of law. When the questionnaire went out, he indicated that he did have a problem with gay people, and perhaps he thought that would be something that would be kept confidential, that maybe he wouldn't have to talk about it in open court. But the defendant, or the, the juror in question, did acknowledge that he had a problem with gay people, that it would be in the back of his mind. Uh, again, it depends on who was asking the questions, whether or not that uh, statement was made. And I think the Court of Appeals had it right in their footnote when it said that the rehabilitative efforts that the court and the state um, put forth in trying to rehabilitate, rehabilitate this juror uh, probably weren't successful. As far as the state's concerned that the defense would uh, make a multitude of challenges for cause and then not use peremptories to remove those people if they weren't removed for cause, that uh, is problematic because then it indicates that the trial counsel was sabotaging his own case. And I don't think that any uh, competent counsel would try and do that. And that uh, we ask the court to reverse Mr. Jones's conviction and remand for a new trial. Thank you. Thank you as well, Mr. Branchow. State versus Jonas is now then submitted and the bailiff may adjourn court. Hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable Supreme Court of the State of Iowa is now adjourned.